Classes in Statistical Mechanics. Lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, Springer Verlag, 2000. And today, this lecture is Lecture 24. In today's lecture, we're going to take up a discussion of projection operators and the mori swansing formalism. This is lecture 26. Um, the projection operators, to a certain extent, are how we sort out which variables depend on each other. The mori swansing formalism has a large number of different derivations. The one you're going to see here differs from many of those in the literature in that it's done entirely in time domain. <clears throat> now, superficially, doing it entirely in time domain makes it a bit more complicated. Uh, the alternative, which, which is to use Laplace transforms, suffers from the extremely serious defect uh, that you've covertly assumed that those Laplace transforms exist. And in point of fact, I have seen Maury Swansig applied to solve equations where indubitably there was no Laplace transform and the answers that were being obtained were, well, not terribly right either. So we start on page 348 and we begin with the question of how time evolution of it works. And the first statement is we have a state of the system, a point in the ensemble. And the point of the ensemble definition that we have an ensemble is that we have for each state of the system a complete physical description. A list of all of the mechanical variables, the values assigned to each of those variables, and a statement of the statistical weight. So what are the variables that describe a point in phase space? Why they're the phase space coordinates gamma seen in equation 26.1. By definition, a mechanical property of the system is one you can calculate by taking the state of the system, sticking in values for all of the phase space coordinates, and crunching the numbers. And therefore, any mechanical variable A is some A of, which is a function of gamma, the positions and momenta. How does A depend on time? Well, maybe you should first ask, why does it depend on time? And the answer is, here is our, part, our point in phase space. The part of, in almost all states of the system, the position coordinates are changing because the particles are moving. And if the particles in the system move, their phase space coordinates change. And therefore, the phase space coordinate of this point in phase space is moving as time goes on. Also, in general, the particles are exerting forces on each other, or at least the walls of the system occasionally exert forces on the particles to keep them inside. And therefore, the momentum of the particles is changing as time goes on, and the phase space coordinates are also changing along the momentum axes. So if we have a variable A, we can expand its time dependence as seen in equation 26.2, where we see, say that the full derivative is the sum of all of the partial derivatives. And the um, a is a function of p, p is a function of t, and therefore we have this large complicated object in 26.2. We have a partial of a with respect to t, and then we have, for example, partial of A with respect to P, partial of P with respect to T. And in all of the partials, the appropriate other variables are being held constant. <coughs> OK. For the mechanical variables of interest here, there is no explicit time dependence. Uh, the ensemble is timeless. There are time intervals, but there's no absolute time. And therefore, A only depends on time because the positions and momenta depend on time. However, dp dt and dr dt can both be written in terms of the derivatives of the system Hamiltonian. So that dp dt is dh 
D, um, I'm sorry, DRDTs, DHDP, and vice versa. And so we get to equation 26.3. Um, A is um, an object. It can be factored out of the square brackets, and the square brackets then become a differential operator. And there are two next ways to proceed. One is to say um, DADT 26.3 is given by the so-called Poisson bracket of 26.5. That really isn't at all useful here, but I mention it. And the other choice is that we introduce a Liouville operator L, and the Liouville operator L is the thing in square brackets of 26.4. The Liouville operator generates the time rate of change in A. So in terms of the Liouville operator, one writes DADT equals script LA, that's 26.7. And G, suppose, you know, if A is a function, A is a mechanical variable, so is DADT. Therefore, uh, I can take DDT of A, and by iteration, I get equation 26.8, which is that DDT to the n power of a is Liouville operator to the n power of a, and that has a formal solution. And the formal solution is that a at time t is e to the t l. That's an exponential of a very complicated differential operator times a of zero, where a of zero is has all these phase space coordinates in it and is therefore time dependent. The exponential is just a symbol for the Taylor series. Uh, minor aside, some authors doing this for statistical mechanics prefer to define L to be pure imaginary, and they do this by multiplying in an i, and then the solution becomes e to the i t L prime. But if you look hard at those, and maybe I should have dropped in an extra minus sign. Um, gee, guess what? Um, that's exactly the same as equation 26.9. That is, you can put an I L prime in to um, equation into the definition of the Liouville operator. It shows up in the time evolution. But all of that cancels out, and the Louisville operator really does not have a complex part. Okay, the virtue of this is you get formulas that look like formulas you find in quantum mechanics, where the time evolution operator in quantum mechanics is something else. Um, but the factors of i are sort of illusionary. That is, you factored out an i and a minus i, and that's what you get. Now, there are cases where you have mechanical variables that are complex. For example, we introduced 2613. The uh, spatial Fourier components of the density, there's A sub K in 26.13. Each particle has a location R, J, and when you add up all of those particle lo over all those particle locations, you get a spatial Fourier component, a complex number. The time derivative of that, if you take DDT, is shown in 26.14. And what has been done um, is to say, uh, gee, everything works. Except I have implicitly assumed that the velocity is m times v. That's correct in Cartesian coordinates. If you understand classical mechanics, you immediately remember it's not quite okay in other coordinates. Uh, but however, we're going to set, we're go that definition works just fine in Cartesian coordinates, and that's good enough. <clears throat> now, some people will rewrite 26.7, which is the time derivative, in terms of a Laplace transform Louisville operator. That is, they will take the Laplace transform of equation 26.7. And when you take the Laplace transform, uh, well, you get 26.15. Um, 
Now, adding, subtracting, and multiplying differential operators is perfectly well defined. Dividing with them is not. Um, you can form an interpretation of the equation by taking the inverse of the Laplace transform, at which point you're back at the time evolution equations and you haven't done anything. Um, and there's some unclear or worse issues as to whether all of your Laplace transforms exist. When we do Mori Swanson derivation in time domain, there will be several requirements that are entirely transparent in time domain. And a number of those correspond to the conditions required for the Laplace transforms to work. Okay, now we mentioned once upon a time, as we went through very quickly, the existence of time correlation functions. Variable at one time, variable at a second time, for the same state of the ensemble, average over all initial states of the ensemble. But I can use the time correlation function of 2616, and g, b of t is a function of time, mechanical variable, so I can replace b of t with b of zero and the Liouville operator. That's the middle piece of 2616. Then what you have in 2616 is an ensemble average and the last term of 26.16 writes out the ensemble average. The integral d gamma is the sum over all states of the system. Uh, the e to the minus beta w of gamma is the statistical weight, which has implicitly been normalized. I was running a little space short of space on that line. And the a of 0, e to the tl, b of 0, that last piece, is all, the, is all determined by what the system is doing at time 0. And that's the statement that if you know the val what the system is doing at time zero, if you know all the variables perfectly, uh, everything that happens after then is a determinant. Okay. Next problem is how we evaluate 26.16. Um, even for very simple problems, toy problems, for example, bouncing ball. Consider v of 0, v of t for a bouncing ball. Yes? Well, v of 0 depends on the height. v of 0 is the velocity. v of t depends on which way the ball was going and how fast it was going. And the correlation function, if you have, say, a thermal distribution of velocities and heights, gets messy. But you could do it. Okay. We now advance to projection operators. Um, the projection operators were introduced by Swansig some, quite some time ago. The general idea is that the set of all mechanical variables in the system uh, form an infinite dimensional vector space. And you can um, say the equal time correlation functions a of 0, b of 0 are the dot product. It's a scalar product. It takes an object and it maps it onto a number. That's what a scalar product does. Uh, you may want to be a little fancier and say that a and b could be vectors or tensors or some other amusing thing. Then you have to talk a bit about what the mapping does. But if the variables are treated all as scalars, so px, py, and pz of gas atom 1 are three variables, all you have are scalar, scalar variables. Now, <clears throat> the one problem with this that some people will note is that if we sit at time equals 0, there are large numbers of variables that are not orthogonal. And because the variables are not orthogonal to each other, um, the basis, treating these as basis factors, say that basis factors are not orthogonal. Now, once upon a time, this would have been viewed as a very serious problem because you wanted to do things in terms of li traditional linear algebra. And in traditional linear algebra, the basis factors, like the basis states in quantum, are orthogonal, perpendicular to each other. Uh, however, um, 
modern advances in describing systems, things like wavelets and frames, make clear that orthogonality is a feature, it's not something you cannot live without. And having a set of non-orthogonal basis vectors, well, if you want to do an expansion, you may have to know what you're doing, um, is not a prerequisite for advancing. Um, Byrne and Pecora, who are one of the groups of people, the book on laser quasi-elastic light scattering, developed Maury Swansig theory using a notation that makes tries to make statistical mechanics look exactly like quantum mechanics. So they represent their basis vectors using bra and ket vectors. Yes? Well, um, this either is a comfort or a nuisance. It depends whether you're into quantum mechanics or not. Uh, however, the traditional, if we have two ve vectors A and B, the dot product is ensemble average of A complex conjugate times B. Oh, why do we put the complex conjugate in? Let's look back at page, page 349 in equation 26.13. If we compute ensemble average of A sub K times A sub K, you discover it averages to zero. If you take A sub K times A sub K complex conjugate and take the ensemble average, you get a number out. And that's the way, it's a choice. It's not something you prove because it's something where you had alternatives and could choose them one way or the other, and that's the one we're choosing. And the ensemble average of A complex conjugate times B is the same as bra A ket B notationally. Um, however, in statistical mechanics, we do something you don't do in quantum mechanics. Namely, we consider correlation functions of more than two variables. So, for example, a times a of 0, b of 0, c of t. Yes? Well, you can't represent that conveniently with bras and cats because you've got three variables in the product. A way around this is to say, well, we have a set of linear variables and a times b is a bilinear variable, and we introduce it as a new variable. Um, you can do that. Um, now let's see. I said that the set of all functions of gamma functions as a, a linear vector space. And what that means is that if a and b are both functions of gamma, and we add them up, we still have a function of gamma. Yes? Sound perfectly reasonable? Mm -hmm. So let us consider the variable x plus v. x component, x component of the position of particle 1 plus x component of the velocity of particle 1. What are the dimensions of this variable? You're adding things with different units. You can't do that. It only, it, oh, that's only an issue if you believe in units. Do we scale them out? There are a couple of ways to do it. One is to scale them out and to say we will do everything in terms of a set of um, reference units. And if you have chosen a set of reference units, which means a complete set of um, basic dimensions, which are usually length, width, time, excuse me, length, mass, time, not length, width, time. Um, you could scale them out. Or you could say, as all normal physicists would have done until my PhD advisor's PhD advisor wrote his book, um, so we have a formula, x plus v, it's well determined. It's 3 feet per second plus 12 miles per hour. 3 plus 12 equals 15. And anyone else who evaluates that will get the same number. It's just we are writing formulas that are only correct in one system of units. That's the same as scaling things out. If you have suffered through thermodynamics, you may remember 
there are formulas for O activity where you have nat log of P, the pressure, and there's some mumbling about with respect to a reference pressure. Well, if you look up the deriv good derivation, you will discover it's really nat log of P over P0 because there was a pressure at each end of the integration limits, and you were supposed to keep both of those when you do the definite integral. Some people are a little careless about that. Okay, so um, this is a bit of a problem. And you should be aware and be careful if you're actually doing calculations that you don't blunder into something that you didn't intend to. Okay, to define a vector space, you also need an inner product, a scalar product. Um, and I make the point for um, orthodox three vectors, there is a standard definition of the vector product, which is towards the bottom of 351, the scalar product ax, bx, plus ay, by, plus, and so forth. That's the vector dot product. <clears throat> People don't always emphasize that that definition is not unique. It's something you chose. For example, you could have chosen ax plus ay plus az quantity times bx plus by plus bz. And I have just described a function that takes two vectors and turns it into a scalar, just like the re regular dot product does. The, why did we make the choice? And the answer is that the scalar product, <coughs> the normal definition of the dot product, uh, is invariant to rote, is the length of the, if it's a dot a, it's the length of the vector, yes? Mm -hmm. That says, and it is, it's invariant to rotation of the coordinate axes. If I take my coordinate axes here and rotate them, the components of the vector change, but the dot product does not. It's an invariant. On the other hand, the funny thing I just defined is very definitely not an invariant. It's a function of the coordinates. <clears throat> okay. So having said this, we would like to define a scalar product in statistical mechanics. And I first suggest if we, if we have two mechanical variables, A and B, one answer is the um, ensemble average is 26.17 of A times B. And if you think about this a bit and set A equal to B, you get the interesting feature that that scalar product has the property that almost any variable with a Fourier transform times itself, that is the, what you think should be the length of A, is instead zero. And you have defined a dot product which has the inf interesting property that vast numbers of vectors are orthogonal to themselves, which some people for some reason take dimly. So instead, uh, what we do is to take a different choice, namely the dot product is A star B ensemble average. That's equation 26.20. Okay, so that's a definition of the dot product for B. Having said that, with this definition of the scalar product, you can prove a bunch of things. For example, you can prove <coughs> that the dot product is positive semi, may be infinite, but it's never negative. If a dot a is a zero, that's lemma two, then a must be zero. That is, if the length of something is zero, then the function of a star, scalar product of a with itself is zero, then a itself must be zero. Um, the dot product defined this way is distributive, that's lemma three. And I also show what happens if you take the complex conjugate of the dot product, namely you get the dot product in reverse order. And that sort of says that this dot product is not exactly normally commutative. And I drop in a few definitions. If a dot a is equal to 1, we're top of page 353, a is normalized. 
if a dot b is zero, a and b are orthogonal. Um, if we follow 26.18, we'd have the interesting feature that a and a star are um, orthogonal. Um, that's related to the statement that the sine and the cosine are orthogonal. And we now introduce the projection operator, 26.21. What is the idea of, of 26.21? We have some vector a. Here's vector a. And here's another vector, my arm, b. And what I do is to say, I will take the dot product of the vector a with my arm vector, yes? And this has its as magnitude the component of this vector that is parallel to a. Yes. Now I'll divide out the square of the length of a and I will take this number and multiply it into a vector. And I now have a vector pointing in the direction of a as long as the component of my arm vector that is pointed in the direction of the pencil. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you think of the standard formula for extracting, say, the x component of the vector, namely v dot i hat, time, which is a number, times i hat, that is exactly what the formula 26.21 does. The only slight difference is that I didn't tell you that i hat, that pencil vector was a unit vector. If it's not a unit vector, it has a length. We want to divide the length out. And that's what the um, denominator in 26.21 does. We're dividing out the length and turning a into a unit vector in the a direction. Oh, by the way, it's a unit vector. What are the dimensions of a unit vector? Units one. of a unit vector. One. It's one, absolutely correct. And that's what we do here. <clears throat> then we derive a few results. And one is that the projection of A with respect to A is the original vector. That is, the component of this vector that is parallel with itself is this vector. Uh, however, you can also prove it mathematically. Also, P squared, if you apply P to the same thing twice, um, you get out the original projection operator. Why? Well, the set first projection operator takes my arm and extracts from it the component of the arm for that is parallel to the pencil, which is the vector A. Now we come in with a projection operator and try to extract the component of this pencil vector that is parallel to itself. It's itself. That's P squared equals P. Finally, 26.25 says what happens when you take the complex conjugate of a um, g dot product pf. And you notice you get f star dot product pg. 26.25 relies on the instatement, the ensemble average, the integrals d gamma, and the a of gamma rather the x minus beta e, the statistical weight, are real numbers. Which says in the original coordinate system, the rn and the pn, all of the variables must be real or you're in trouble. Okay. Um, I have occasionally stuck a comma into the projection operator. Do you see the commas in 26.25? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, the purpose of the commas is simply to make it a little more clear in reading what two variables are being brought together. Uh, the, because the things are multiplied, the presence of the comma really has no effect, but it lets you see what the calculation is doing. Um, uh, in lemma 4, um, it's worthwhile to remember the rule that the complex product, 
conjugate of the product a b c is a star b star c star the product of the complex conjugates and i then give some de de uh, discussion of how you derive 26.25 finally i define an identity operator and the identity operator has the property that the dot product of i and any vector b is the original vector b well that's what for example a matrix with one down the core up down the um, diagonal you hit it with any vector and the, the dot product of i with any vector is the any vector nothing doesn't do anything that's what an identity operator does <clears throat> and finally i introduce conjugate operator q and q is i minus p so if, if this were a one variable system, you'd say it's 1 minus the projection with respect to the one variable. Okay? So why do we care about Q? Well, with some work, it's a pr homework problem which you did not hear me assign. Um, Q equals I minus P is a projection operator that it is, it is a diff differential operator, in general, which satisfies equations 26.23 to 26.25. Also, straightforward math, Q plus P is the identity. Um, we can also ask um, G, let us take the projection with respect to Q Q is, is the projection perpendicular to A. And what is the dot product of QB with A? Well, Q is a projection operator. Maybe that should be a script. Q. That really sh it's okay. Um, it's a math script Q right above equation 26.26. So I take a variable B. I project it using a projection operator Q that is orthogonal to the projection operator P. I end up with the component of my original vector that is perpendicular to the vector A. Yes? And now I ask what is the dot product of this vector that's orthogonal to A with A? It's zero. Well, uh, if you had turned the crank in 26.26, I show you how to do it. You can show, in fact, Q and P are orthogonal operators. They split any mechanical variable into two parts. One is the part projected along P, and one is the part that is not projected along P. It's everything that's left over. So that's the projection operator. Um, and I give you some the next three equations at the top of 354. Those equations simply describe properties of vector dot products. And if you look at them, they look just like the projection operator equations, but they're actually just linear algebra equations. Okay, so we are going to push ahead and do the Mori derivation. And to do the der Mori derivation, the motivation, so to speak, is, is to look at the Langevin equation 26.30, which, by the way, has a mistake. There should not be a 1 over m in the first term on the right-hand side, because the other side of the equation is p, not v. So, so just cross out the m. There. The 1 over m is not there in 2630 and in 2631. So it should read dp of t dt equals minus f p of t plus script f of t. Correct. Okay. And, and the same is true in the next equation. Okay. So it should read ds yes. f of t minus s p s plus f of t. Yes. Okay. Okay. So. 
script F and script F of T minus S are friction factors. Uh, fancy script capital F is the random force. Um, it, the fluctuation dissipation theorem says that the random force and the drag coefficient have to be related. Uh, for example, by Kirkwood's formula, that's 2632, which is the drag coefficient is f of 0, f of t, ensemble average. And since this is the infinite, the slow thing, we just do the integral of f of 0, f of t, dt. We do the integral because we're not claiming that f of 0 is a delta function. If the correlation function of script f were the random force with itself were a delta function, the integral in 2632 would just cancel the delta function. Otherwise, it's an integral. OK. And now we have the vague idea, since we're saying we can split the total force into its components, we ought in some sense be able to introduce projection operators to do this. And that's hinted at in equation 26.33. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, if you actually try evaluating that, um, one of the things you get is a v dot dp dt times v. We're projecting it with respect to v. That is, we say we have the force on an object at time t. And we will project out the part of the force that is, deter that is linear in the velocity. Yes? Mm -hmm. Well, if you actually do that, you get an ensemble average v of 0, p dot of 0. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, look at what happens under time reversal. The velocity changes its sign. p changes its sign. d dt changes its sign. Under time reversal, this thing changes its sign. And um, gee, that looks a little undesirable. Um, if you look at time reversal symmetry, you realize that would appear to cancel. And it would be zero. So it's anti-symmetric with respect to time? It's, 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 yes, and it's therefore it's zero. Vanishes, and therefore doing exactly what I just proposed does not quite work. It's an idea, and you try it, and you look at it a bit, and you notice the correlation function vanishes. Um, well, you know, correlation functions do sometimes vanish, and sometimes this can be very annoying. Um, having given the introduction, we now start on the definition of the Mori der derivation of the mori swansig equation. And the first thing we do is to note we have a um, projection operator with respect to A at time 0. Um, and you may say, what have I done that I did not do before with the projection operator? Well, first of all, there's a subscript A on the projection, P. That's because we're projecting with respect to A. We could be projecting with respect to something else. We also could, at least, we are, and we will at some point, be projecting with respect to a variable at a different time than zero. But if I just write P A, it's the projection with respect to A at time zero. Okay. Projection involves the variable A at a fixed time. So the projection operator commutes with the time derivative. That is, the projection operator is with respect to the values of the variable at a fixed time, 0. And therefore, d dt of pb is p times b dot. Uh, note also, I'm going to be using Newton fluxion notation for derivative. So there's a superscript dot for de time derivative. Otherwise, the equations become a little bulky. I then throw in some de four derivations, 2636 through 2639. Um, and what are they? Well, 2636 capital Xi is the correlation function of A of 0, A of T, but it's been normalized. 
I omega is the correlation function of A and A dot. You will correctly say, well, in general, that ought to vanish, shouldn't it? And the answer is yes, unless it's something oscillating in time. For example, a variable being driven in an NMR system. And then it wouldn't vanish. And then I introduce K and A prime. A prime is the part of A of t that is orthogonal to a of 0. That is, we start out with a of 0. Here's a of 0. And as time goes on, um, what is going to happen to a? Well, it has a part that is correlated with a of time 0, which in fact gradually fades away. And it has a part that is independent of a of 0, and that is the part a prime. Ditto, k of t is the um, part of dA dt that's orthogonal to a of 0. And that may remind you a bit of the problem with 2633, where we tried to look at v times dv dt, the projection of dv dt, the acceleration with respect to the velocity, and got out this 0. Yes? Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, last point, psi and i omega are numbers. They're project they're, if you look at that, you'll notice they're ensemble averages in the numerator and the denominator. An ensemble average turns whatever is fed into it into a number. A prime and k are functions of A. That is, they're differential operators. There's no ensemble average. Well, there is an ensemble average in the projection operator. Um, after you do the projection, um, you dot it. You, the, it's multi the projection, the number is multiplied into A itself. So these are variables. Okay. Um, a and A dot usually have different parities under time reversal. And therefore, since the system, the Hamiltonian, has time reversal symmetry, the ensemble average of A and A dot is 0. Why is that true? Well, here is a state of the system. And A has some value, and A dot has some value. However, if I calculate the statistical weight of the same system in which things are running backwards so that A dot has been replaced with minus a dot, guess what? This and this have the same statistical weight. There is a way you can get into deep trouble with this. You remember I said you could add variables because it's a linear vector space? Well, suppose I, t suppose I tell you that a and a dot have opposite time reversal parities. Yes? a plus a dot is a mechanical variable, yes? And you notice it does not have par a parity under time reversal. Par if you do time reversal, part of it switches signs, and part of it doesn't, and its numerical value changes. And therefore, you have to be careful, because there are variables. You can create variables that do not have parity under time reversal in this system. You should be aware of that, because if you aren't, the the fact will come back and bite you. Okay. <clears throat> now let us push ahead. And we are going to ask um, what the relationship is between A of t and A of 0. Okay, correlation. Of, so I'm going to write a differential operator. Identity minus projection with respect to A plus projection with respect to A. And if you think about it, that's obviously just the identity operator. And I will apply that operator to A at time t. And when I apply that operator to A at time t, um, which is just above equation 26.40, page 356, well, I sort A of t out, A of t into two parts the part correlated with A and the part that isn't. 
And if I turn the crank and apply 2636 and 2638, I get equation 26.40, which says that A of t is A of 0 times the correlation function of A at 2 times, plus A prime. A prime is I minus P times A. Okay. Mori has a language. Xi of t, a of 0, is the secular part of a of t. Uh, it's the part determined by the after effect function. Oh, what is the after effect function? Go back to the previous page. 26.36 is the after effect function. Actually, in this chapter, it's only defined implicitly in the discussion after 2640. Namely, it's the part of A at time t that is correlated with time at the part at A of 0. It's what's left of A of 0 at time t. Okay? Yes. Okay. Second, A prime of t, the non-secular part of t, can be written in terms of variables at time zero. How do we do this? We start by saying that dA dt is Liouville operator times A. Yes? Mm -hmm. And we then apply 2640 and 2635, uh, which is the, time, the statement if we take the time derivative of the projection of B, it's the projection of the time derivative of B. Yes. So, I will take I minus P of dA dt. Well, that is I minus P of the time derivative of A is Liouville operator of G. What have I done? I have written A using equation 26.40. The last square brackets in 2640 is, or 2641 rather, is equation 2640 is a way to write A. All I have done here is replacement. The projection operator and the time derivative and commute, so on the left hand side I have d dt of i minus p times A. That is on the left side I'll take the time derivative to the outside. But what is i minus p times A? Which is at any time. It's the part of A that is orthogonal to A of 0, because I project that part out. It's A prime. Yes? I also went to the other side. It's a sum of two terms. And I split out the I minus, from 2641, I split out the I minus PL times A prime and took it to the left side of the equation, leaving psi of T times G. That's actually k at time 0. You have to reorder terms a bit, but remember, psi is just a number. The differential operator is waltz right through it, so I have psi of t times i minus pl. I have equation 26.42. And I see we have run us out of time, so I will close by pointing out this is a linear different, this is a differential equation. It has a formal homogeneous part, the left side, uh, whose solution is A prime equals an exponential of an object times A, and it has a source term. In other words, it's exactly like the uh, Langevin equation, except now instead of exponentiating gamma equals F over M, I exponentiate this complicated differential operator and I get equation 26.43. And that is where we will start next time. We are done.